held a meeting with security officials after the Met Police Commissioner warned terrorism is being accelerated. Meantime, 33 lorries carrying food, medicine and other supplies entered Gaza from Egypt yesterday. But Fiki Shaltut is Gaza director for medical aid for Palestinians and told LBC a colleague told her it's just not enough. We have no access to drinkable water, to water for domestic use. We have no cooking gas and we have no electricity. She said, I'm desperate and I don't know what to do. A former senior government official under Boris Johnson has apologised for his part in the Partygate scandal. Martin Reynolds has been giving evidence at the COVID inquiry. Avanti West Coast says it'll cancel some Saturday services between London and Manchester due to staff shortages. The timetable will be cut from three to two per hour between 9th of December until the end of the year. It was defeat for Andy Murray against Alex de Minaur in the first round of the Paris Masters tennis. He suffered a 5-2 lead in the deciding set and smashed his racket in frustration at the end. In the city, the FTSE 100s closed up 36 points at 73.27. The pound buys $1.21 and €1.14. Euro LBC weather, heavy showers, particularly in the southwest of England and low of freezing. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening and welcome to Monday's Cross Question. We have a great panel for you tonight to answer your calls. If you'd like to put a question to them, 0345 6060973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or you can say, Alexa, send a message to LBC and you can watch us on Global Player. And the four beautiful people that you will be watching are indeed Tim Lawton, <laughs> Conservative MP for East Worthing and Shoreham. Did my nose get a little bit longer there? <laughs> Sorry about that, Tim. Uh, Mary Cray, the nose has shrunk again. Former Labour MP for Wakefield, who served in various shadow cabinet positions under Ed Miliband. Natasha Devon, LBC presenter, Saturdays, 8 till... 7 till 7 nine. till 9. I nearly got it right, 7 <laughs> till 9. He's a regular. <laughs> <laughs> and a mental health campaigner. And William Atkinson, who is assistant editor of Conservative Home and has just been named in a very, very important list, which I will be quizzing him on later in the programme, just to put him at his ease as it's his debut on the show. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. All right, let's go to a serious question from Hassan in Kensington. Hassan, what would you like to ask the panel? Uh, hi. Uh, considering Starmer has uh, suspended Andy McDonald for a rather uh, sensible statement. Should he go after Tadek Khan, Andy Burnham and Anas Sarwar next? Because who cares whether they have sort of uh, their own mandates from the public? Well, those three, they, they have said that they think the Labour Party should be calling for a ceasefire, which is not Labour Party policy. That Labour Party policy is to call for uh, pauses in military action to enable aid to get into uh, Gaza. Uh, Andy MacDonald, former Shadow Cabinet member, uh, he made a speech to a Palestinian rally on Saturday and he mentioned the phrase from the river to the sea, though he did include Israelis in it, not just Palestinians, but uh, Keir Starmer has suspended the Labour whip because of that. And, of course, today also, Rishi Sunak sacked Paul Bristow, the Conservative MP for Peterborough, for saying there should be a permanent ceasefire. Now, he's a PPS at the Department of Science, um, the lowest rank of the on the junior ministerial ladder. Um, and so he's gone now. So both main parties are having their issues here. Mary Cray, let's start with you. Um, it seems a bit of a harsh punishment for Andy MacDonald. Well, I think Andy um, has been suspended. Now, I know there was a correction from the Times about their reporting of this issue, but that issue will now go to an independent panel and that will rightly be looked at and they will doubtless have the footage of what he said. There'll be recordings, I'm sure. But 
you know, from the river to the sea is generally used, it, it's a very hurtful phrase because it implies the, the non-existence of the state of Israel, the eradication of the state of Israel. And so I think any anybody using that in, in this context who is politically elected needs to show a massive degree of I mean, care the, the Israeli and caution. The ambassador to the UK has used the very same phrase with regard to Israel. Right, OK, well... That's as and, may be. I mean, let's just he's, quote he's what, and, what Andy McDonald said. He said, we won't... Re well, this is according to Owen Jones, so it must be true. Uh, we won't rest until we have justice, until all people, Israelis and Palestinians, between the river and the sea, can live in peaceful liberty. It's those who oppose such a statement... Oh, no, that's, that's Owen Jones talking there. OK. No, I mean, that seems to me to be a completely reasonable thing to say. I think it's the phrase from the river to the sea that is generally used by Hamas to describe the eradication of the state of Israel. If that was not his intention, then he will have his chance to make those representations. But this is a decision for the chief whip and for the party's national executive So why committee. don't they suspend Sadiq Khan, Andy Burnham and Anna Sawa for going <clears throat> against the leader of the party? Each of those, I, I know I served in shadow cabinet with Sadiq Khan. I was Andy Burnham's PPS when he was health secretary. And Anas Sawa was my number two when I was shadow diffid. So I know all of them care deeply um, about the humanitarian suffering on both sides in this conflict. Um, but I think looking at this conflict from the prism of, you know, who's up and who's down in the Labour Party is, is the wrong way to look at it. I think the question has to be, what does a ceasefire um, what does a ceasefire mean and w does it include Hamas? We need to get both sides laying down weapons, making sure that humanitarian aid can reach Gaza and also dealing with the growing problem of internally displaced people uh, in Israel itself who are moving from border regions to find greater safety and security um, in their own country. So the ceasefire must be accompanied by a diplomatic solution. And so in are you in favour of a ceasefire or a pause? I think Keir is right when he talks about humanitarian pauses. At the moment, there is military action ongoing by Israel in response to the terrorist atrocities committed by Hamas on October the 7th. And I think that us, the, 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 the Labour Party, in lockstep with the government... It is, it's important that we maintain unity on this issue, but that we also make sure that Israel's response is conducted within the parameters but, of international law. Well, um, which is exactly what the government has said uh, as well. But it seems to me there isn't really much difference between a pause and a ceasefire. A pause in, in, it means virtually the same thing. Isn't this just self-indulgent guff on the part of people who call for a ceasefire? Because we know that the Israelis aren't going to agree to a ceasefire. Hamas have said today that there's no way that they are either. So all it does is make Western liberals feel good about themselves. Well, I think there's a there's a part that is, you know, as I say, looking at this, the sort of dreadful catastrophe that is unfolding. Um, but it's important that um, the Labour Party is listening and is learning and you know, Labour is a very diverse party. But to your question, what will the meaningful impact on the ground be? The, we need to get to a place where we can pause the fighting and where there can be a space for some form of diplomatic okay. activity. Tim Lawton. Well, the trouble is, there's a lot of disingenuity around how you define this um, uh, this phrase. And if you are... From Hamas, the river to the sea. From the river to the sea is widely understood, certainly by Hamas, certainly by uh, the Iranians. And if you remember, President Ahmadinejad some years ago talked about driving the uh, Israelis, the Jews, into the uh, into sea as well. There's no doubt that it means eradicating the state of uh, Israel uh, and for Hamas, eradicating uh, all those Jews who live um, within it. Now, an experienced politician like Andy will know that this is an inflammatory uh, phrase and will be interpreted in that uh, in that way. The condition he's put on that, when you look at the final detail of what he's said about Israelis and Palestinians uh, still being able to, uh, uh, to, to, to live there, um, 
might get him off the off the hook. But I think he knew what he was uh, doing. The trouble is, there are lots of people going around chanting this phrase. I saw some of them being interviewed yesterday without even knowing which river they were. it, it <laughs> refers to and what the meaning, let alone yeah. the implications of it for those yeah. people yeah. who really do want to do really bad things to anybody who happens to be um, uh, Jewish. It's not a phrase that people should be bandying around um, at all. Including the Israeli ambassador. Well, the Israelis some years ago have used a similar phrase about extending sovereignty to um, uh, to the, the River um, Jordan. Again, is not a help, helpful thing to say, but that does not imply you want to wipe out all the Palestinians who live uh, within that territory as, uh, as, as well. That's exactly what a lot of people on the Free Palestine side of this debate are arguing, that that's exactly what the Israelis do want to do, to wipe out the Palestinians from the State of Israel. A absolutely not. They have no mandate um, to, to do that, um, and the world would be jumping up and down in rage to stop them if that's what they tried to, uh, to do. Remember, Gaza is independent. The Israelis dragged settlers out of the territory of Gaza back in 2005 when they quit that territory to give it to the, uh, the Palestinian um, people who then unfortunately brought upon themselves or had imposed on them a Hamas uh, government. And the thing about they Hamas... did vote for them, admittedly only once. Um, no election since then. It, it, yeah. it, it, was, it was not a good, uh, a good moment. There have not been any elections um, uh, since then. But effectively, they have got a government in Hamas who cares not a jot for the welfare of the people they are governing. They have used them as human uh, shields. They have promoted the poverty uh, and uh, the, the destitution in which they are forced to live because it suits their political aims. And that's the problem. You're not dealing with a rational opponent in this, uh, in this case. So there is a difference between a ceasefire and a, and, and a pause. And there's no way that Hamas is going to agree to a ceasefire uh, anyway. I would like to see a pause so we can deal with the very real immediate humanitarian crisis of innocent uh, Palestinians who've got limited places to go uh, and in the south okay. need those uh, need those supplies but Israel needs to realize its objectives the two primary objectives being to release 220 hostages uh, which um, Hamas still uh, uh, still has and to stop Hamas uh, launching another offensive as it did and constantly shooting rockets into innocent uh, Israeli which it is uh, still doing every day which it is still and doing Natasha now. Devon. Well, I should say, because my show is on a Saturday, for the past three weekends, I have come into central London and been amongst these protests. And I think that if you were just reading about them in the tabloid media, the mood has been very much misrepresented. We have to remember there were half a million people in central London on Saturday. I think only even the organisers only claimed 300,000. OK, uh, well, <laughs> a lot. between 300,000 and half a, a million, only five arrests. I th have found the process to be incredibly peaceful. In fact, I would say that there was an air of sadness uh, that permeated a lot of it. With this phrase, from the river to the sea, I think a lot of people... They chant it not knowing what it means. They like it because it rhymes. They think it's a call to arms. And they didn't know that it was an anti-Semitic dog whistle. Andy McDonald should have known that, particularly yeah. in the context of a Labour Party which is trying to shake off a, a reputation for being anti-Semitic. I think really, even if he was trying to reclaim the phrase in some way by including the Israelis in it, he ought to have known better. OK. William Atkinson from Conservative Home. Um, well, I think the um, the basic point is the same one that all the previous panellists have touched upon. You know, was Andy McDonnell using this phrase to show a bit of leg um, to pro-Hamas activists in his constituency? Or was he using it in a pretty weak attempt to imitate Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder? Because he managed to even get a rhyme in there at the end. Um, and I think if he was intending to do it in a very cynical way, to try and appease you know, particular activists who take a pro-Hamas line, um, then what he was doing was frankly despicable because he knows the context of this phrase and as you know, Mary pointed out, he's a smart enough man to know that he shouldn't have said that. Um, on the other hand, if this was meant as you know, yourself uh, suggested, Ian, as some form of sort of liberal hand-wringing, then it's as impotent as any other attempt um, to try and wish away this conflict is always going to be. And I think, you know, quite frankly, we're debating at the moment the sort of whether one man's peace, uh, sorry, one man's um, ceasefire is another man's pause. Um, 
But I think what we're seeing is a situation that's increasingly escalating out of control. We can only hope that it doesn't bring into sort of evolve into a sort of wider regional war. But you know, questions over the future of whether there is going to be a sort of one or two state solution are increasingly on the table. And I think the situation is only going to get worse. And for Labour politicians, and indeed for Conservative politicians, to use it simply as an opportunity to gesture to their voters or particular groups and their constituencies is utterly despicable. And I don't think, you know, actually sort of reflective of the office that they hold. Natasha, I, I said in your introduction, as well as presenting on LBC, you're a mental health campaigner. Um, I think a lot of people in this country, no matter what field of work they're in, are struggling with this conflict. And I think you, you've presented lots of phone-ins on this over the last three weeks. I mean, you were on air the day that the t initial Hamas attack happened. Um, how can people protect themselves from this? I mean, I've decided today that I'm not going to have my text for the first time in 13 years. I'm not having text come through live on my screen because I was on air for three hours on Saturday and it was just soul-destroying what was coming through. The most vicious, vile abuse, not just to me, but to sort of lots and lots of different types of people. How, how can people protect themselves? It's people are relying on social media at the moment because there are problems with electricity and internet, which, which have been shut off in the Gaza Strip. Al Jazeera has also reported that some of their journalists have been directly targeted by the Israeli government and told to get out of the area. There is a lack of information as to what is actually going on, and people are relying on social media. So what that means is, any time you step into the social media sphere, you are going to see incredibly upsetting content involving children children and uh, often and that would impact anyone's mental health. So I think there are settings that you can use, which means it means that you don't see certain hashtags, you don't see certain content. And I think the most important thing is to realize that that doesn't mean you don't care, doesn't mean that you're being selfish. Sometimes you just need to dip out and restore. And I also think that there is a, um, a particularly if you're in the, the public eye, and I have to say, particularly if you're a woman, mm people going to you, talking to you as though you have the power to solve this. You know, when are you going to stand up for this group of people or that group of people with this expectation that your voice will be the voice that will finally end the conflict? And of course, that's nonsense. This is a conflict that has gone on for, for decades. Um, so I think it's it, it let go of this idea that just because you're not keeping on top of everything, that that is a selfish act somehow. Right, we'll move on in just a few minutes' time. 0345 6060 973. Uh, by the way, in case you think I'm not seeing any text, my producers are putting through <laughs> ones that for me to read out. Um, so I, I do see some of them. It's 18 minutes past eight. You may not know the name, but you will know the music. When you need a change of pace, try LBC's sister station, Classic FM, and enjoy the world's greatest music. Listen on your radio, on Global Player, or ask your smart speaker to play Classic FM.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. With me on the panel, Conservative MP Tim Lawton, former Labour MP Mary Cray, LBC presenter Natasha Devon and from Conservative Home, William Atkinson. Now, just before we came on there, William, you were telling us that you've been included in a rather prestigious article in... What was it? Tatler. Tatler um, magazine. I think I've been named, I think it's their annual black book, um, which is uh, apparently their list of um, most eligible young um, bachelors and bacheloresses uh, in the UK, um, which I mean, she'll come as a, a shock um, to my girlfriend, um, first of all, but I think um, I think it's more importantly, uh, as somebody who's not necessarily the poshest person in the world, despite the affectation of the tweed and the like, is uh, <laughs> rather a bizarre privilege to have, but nevertheless, you know, one, I'm, I'm willing, one I'm willing to burden. Um, I have been told, say, by every day I've texted about it, that my life's downhill from here, so uh, maybe it's... Uh, maybe Natasha it's Devon, would you like to give... William, some advice <laughs> on how you should handle this momentous news. No. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever seen you lost for words. I just can't relate, Ian. You know, this is so far removed from anything I've ever experienced. I'm sure you must have won a similar award in your time. What, as an eligible bachelor? Et. No. No? Really? No. Okay. Right, let's move on before I dig myself <laughs> even deeper. <laughs> ben Clacton wants to have a word. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian. Uh, good evening, panel. Um, why didn't the scientists and the politicians speak out at the time if they knew that Johnson was useless at handling the pan pandemic? Well, Martin Reynolds, his, um, I'm trying to remember what rank he was, but he was a very senior civil servant in Downing Street. He's been giving evidence at the COVID inquiry today. Um, it didn't go particularly well, either for him or indeed the former Prime Minister, it has to be said. Um, Tim Lawton, every, basically what Ben is saying is everyone knew Boris was useless. Why didn't they speak out? Well, I think it's a bit unfair. You know I'm not a big fan of, um, of, of Boris. I mean, they've been... This is early days in this uh, inquiry. We've got loads of blockbusters to come. We've got Dominic Cummings uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. No doubt will be all over the headlines as, uh, as well. To Just to have some sympathy, when this thing hit back in 2020, nobody had seen the like. There was no manual that said, oh, it's a pandemic, you, uh, this is what you need to, uh, to do. So there was a lot of fast thinking on your, on your feet and lots of different views. And I always said right from the, uh, the start, there were sort of three things that you need to, to balance. One of which, what the science uh, is, uh, is telling you, and there are lots of different scientific views as, uh, as, as well. Secondly, what the impact on the uh, economy may, may be, if, doing lockdowns or restricting people's liberty. And thirdly, really importantly, what the people be prepared to put up with? Because if they thought the, the lockdown rules were disproportionate, they wouldn't obey them, in which case nothing would, uh, nothing would work. And I think that balance, that, those arguments, uh, didn't come until much, much later. If you are a scientist, you are faced with a, an infectious pandemic, then scientifically, the best way to defeat it is everybody stays isolated at home. Scientifically, that's a solution. But, OK, so how are you going to get your food? Who's going to make the food? Who's going to deliver the, uh, uh, the food? Who's going to get the drugs? Uh, who's going to man the hospitals to look after people who've got uh, COVID? So this is always going to be a, uh, a balance. So I think you can't say at this stage, and there's loads more to come out of the inquiry, that they were just ill-prepared. They didn't know what they are doing right at the start because nobody else did across the whole of the world. There's no country which absolutely stands out at having been really well-prepared and handled this really, really well. We have arguments about whether Sweden took a better... Uh, rather more liberal uh, approach to it and ended up in fewer deaths. But at the time, it could have gone either uh, either way. So let's not judge harshly at this early stage, but this is not going to be comfortable for the, for the government or the scientific community or a lot of other people as more and more evidence comes to light over the coming days, weeks, months and possibly years. Natasha, let's not judge too harshly. Well, I think that people might be understandably, because people lost loved ones and it was a traumatic time for everyone, but might be too focused on retribution in terms of this COVID inquiry when actually it's about learning lessons. Mm. Because there will be another pandemic that will happen, whether it's in 10 years, 50 years, we don't know. But we have to handle it better than we handled the last one. And from what I can gather, early signs are showing that it's not just that the people in charge were 
incompetent. It, there are issues within the system, the actual system of government being too centralised to be able to deal with this effectively. And so maybe we need to be making systemic changes as a result of this, which would in the future allow whistleblowers to be able to be heard. Just, I remember a conversation I had with somebody, I think he was the mayor of Blackburn, who had gone against some of the national advice and had started to use his own director of public health to do local track and trace when the national system didn't seem to be working. And I was listening to this man speak and I was thinking, why isn't everybody doing this? It's clearly working in Blackburn. If it works in Blackburn, why can't it happen elsewhere? So I think your point about centralisation is really well made. William, you were nodding at that as well. Yes, I entirely um, agree with um, Natasha. I think I've been, I've been opposed to the way that the... Um, COVID inquiry has been set up from the start and I've written about it in CapEx and Spectator amongst um, other outlets. And I think today's sort of set of stories show that it's become exactly what I thought it would become, which is basically just an attempt to get Boris Johnson uh, or at least an attempt in the public mind to confirm a pre-existing narrative which is that um, Boris Johnson and co partied while the rest of the country died or they were incompetent or didn't, they didn't know what they were doing, etc. Um, and I think in the same way that basically Chilcot evolved into an attempt to get Tony Blair to cry on telly, um, that's what this pan... Uh, uh, this, that's what this pandemic inquiry is going to go on and, and, and become, and it's going to take far too long. We're not actually going to learn the necessary lessons, which, as Natasha Reich, rightly points out, should actually focus on the science of the response. You know, they should focus on the ability for scientific advice to interact with the institutions of the British state. And countries like Sweden, whether they took a better approach um, to the pandemic or not, have already in completed their inquiries because they made it hyper-focus on the sort of scientific level of the require of the inquiry, and they've already got it done, and they've already started to learn lessons from it. Whereas instead, we're going to have several years, basically, of tittle-tattle um, and letting light in upon magic, for want of a better, better expression, you know, showing people's WhatsApps, trying to sort of get particular individuals. You know, if, if we'd had WhatsApp during the Second World War, it would have been filled with, you know, cabinet ministers or Allenby or civil servants complaining about Winston Churchill's behaviour, not to be, you know, too um, pro-Boris Johnson on this. Um, so the idea that instead we're going to have years of headlines focusing on what, who said what about whom at any point is not actually going to teach us anything about what we're going to do when, as Nash right, uh, rightly points out, the next pandemic comes along. And I think this is just a sign of the farce that this COVID inquiry is um, inevitably going to be. Mary Cray. Well, I think we're not seeing much light on the magic because, you know, the current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is, is blocking the release of his WhatsApps and he's lost his phones and he doesn't know how to get hold of them. So there's large tranches of information between officials and politicians in, and Nicola Sturgeon the same in Scotland, where we will never know what was said at the, at the top level of, of government. And do I we think, really have a right to see people's WhatsApp messages? Well, I think if they're being used for, for discussions of state and matters are, are literally of life and death, then Absolutely, we do. This is an inquiry that was set up by this government to learn the lessons. Um, the chief uh, permanent secretary is is absent uh, for health reasons and is not giving evidence to it. You know, went on on the sick uh, a week before. We'll see if he ever comes back and is ever able to give that evidence. But what we have seen from Martin Reynolds, principal private secretary, and the case's own WhatsApps, government isn't that hard. But this guy Boris Johnson is making it impossible. And I think if you lost a loved one, as many people did, or, or you lost your business during the pandemic, and, you know, we all went through this collective trauma together as a nation, you know, taking one for the team, taking one to protect the NHS, then you were promised answers. And it, it looks to me like uh, people aren't getting them when this, this evidence is being blocked. And it also puts paid, I'm afraid, you know, to have uh, the evidence today saying that Boris Johnson was off for an important meeting with Evgeny Lebedev, you know, the editor of the London Standard or the owner of the London Standard, who's now in the Lords, whilst, you know, the scientists were saying, we think we need, we need to be sort of taking action and starting to shut things down. He was simply AWOL. And, you know, the evidence that is coming out is absolutely damning. I think tomorrow we're going to hear more of the same. And it certainly puts pays to the government narrative of so-called getting the big calls right. The early calls were the big calls and they were wrong. I think some of them were wrong. 
but there were some that were right. I mean, furlough, for example, that was an early call. Yeah, that done was in right, partnership with the Trade Union Congress. So that was about listening. What I think, to Ben's question, well, so why TUC did... The, the, TUC, yeah, so yeah, yeah. You, you they give them the credit for, for furlough no, no, rather they did than that. British No, 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 no. They, but they did that in a partnership way. The question that Ben asked, why did the scientists not speak out at the time? Yes, it was unprecedented, but I was in um, the health department, the NHS, when we had the swine flu pandemic. I've sat in on those meetings. It is taken very, very seriously. The question is, why did the scientists feel scared? Why did the scientists not coalesce around a particular view? And well, they did. Well, they, they, but the and, second and their, view, their, their view was that lockdown should not happen when a lot of people were wanting it in the middle of March because they thought, well, if we do it too early, people won't obey it. Now, perfectly, they were wrong. Well, they were wrong, but a perfectly reasonable point of view to have. But then the, the the second big call that they made was, we're going to need a lockdown. The, the, you could see the officials saying, we're going to need a lockdown. It's going to have to happen in that October time. Johnson said, absolutely no way we're locking down. And then sort of two weeks later changes his mind. So you've got this issue around, there's no excuse for it. Once, it, once it's happened once, it's just maths. It's just a mathematical question. And Omicron, you know, let it rip, let the virus rip damning evidence coming out from today about why are we um, damaging the economy, why are we destroying the economy for people who, who will die anyway. This is what they were talking about. These are people's lives. And another, an excess 25,000 people died in that winter period of 2020 because the government failed to take action quickly enough. Hindsight is such a wonderful thing, though. They knew they it already. They wrong, though. I mean, the, the average NHS was under... COVID is older than the average age at which people die anyway. So The, the NHS, the, these are excess deaths and this is long COVID and this is the long-term sickness problem and this is there, people dying But there were always going to be excess deaths. I mean, you're talking as if that, that's somehow a, a surprise. Of course there would be excess deaths um, if you have a pandemic. It stands to reason. Of course there will be, but the but the question, the, ma the the excess amount of people that died because of the result of locking down two weeks later was put by John Edmonds, the epidemiologist, to the inquiry at 25,000. That's a hell of a big call to get wrong. OK. Right, we'll move on in just a moment. It's 8.33, news headlines with Serena Farrow. Israel says its ground operation in Gaza has freed a female soldier held hostage by Hamas. Israel's Prime Minister says his country won't agree to a ceasefire as it would be a surrender to Hamas and terrorism. A senior civil servant under Boris Johnson's apologised for his role in Partygate at the Covid inquiry. Martin Reynolds told Downing Street staff to bring their own booze to a gathering during lockdown. And the King and Queen have arrived in Kenya for the start of a five-day state visit. It's their first trip to a Commonwealth country since the coronation. The country is celebrating the 60th anniversary of its independence from Britain. LBC, where the heavy showers continue to affect southwest England, Wales and Northern Ireland tonight... Staying dry in the north, though, with a low of freezing. LBC. With an
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Tim Lawton, Mary Crane, Natasha Devon and Willie Matkins answering your questions. A text question from Peter in Deerham in Norfolk. Do people have a... I, was nearly, I nearly went into a Norfolk accent then, but thought I'd better not. <laughs> uh, do people have a right to know that someone they might be considering giving a job to has been to prison? Now, the background to this is that a law change that came in today means that those who are jailed for up to four years will no longer have to disclose this to potential employers after seven years of rehabilitation. William? Um, I think it's actually, I think it's quite a sensible policy. Um, I think the the sort of cent- the statistics government has put forward um, suggests that you know this should lead to I think I'm saying, I'm saying like a nine percent increase um, in the sort of ability of people to get sort of rehired. They'll have to check that again in a sec. Um, and I think any sort of initiative that encourages people not to return to a life of crime, not to reoffend, um, but actually to sort of re- be reintegrated into society, um, is probably the best one. Not only for themselves personally, not only for the crime statistics, but for you know the public finances and sort of. So you have to wait for well. seven years. I mean, I wonder how many people will fall into that category. Yeah, but exactly. But I mean, it's already it's already quite a long wait. And this is also obviously excluding the people that you'd be most worried about reemploying. You know, this is this is people who've been sort of put in prison, perhaps at a young age, for various petty crimes. This is not sort of sex offenders or, you know, terrorist subjects, suspects, etc. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, everybody who's been in prison, and we have, you know, the vast majority of crimes are committed by a very small number of people continually committing offences. And if we've, as we've recently discovered, not actually got the space to actually lock them all up, um, we've got to find some way to actually reintegrate people into society. And so I think this sounds like a very good, you know, a very good initiative. After all, not all of these people can go and work at Timpsons, so we've got to find some alternative uh, employment for them um, as well. Natasha. I didn't expect to be sitting next to somebody who writes for The Spectator and to agree <laughs> so wholeheartedly. It's the joy of this programme. I agree <laughs> with everything that's just been said, uh, other than I would take away the, the seven-year rehabilitation because, as you quite rightly say, seven years is enough to struggle to get another job and potentially to reoffend and to be caught still in that cycle. But for for low-level crimes, you know, we have to look at how we can reduce reoffending and allow people to reintegrate into society and this is a great way of doing it. Four year sentence though, I mean, you have to mm. have done something pretty bad to have got four years. Uh, that That's my only, I mean I'm as well as a lettuce on prison reform but I just think four years, I think if I was an employer mm. I'd quite like to know what that person had done. But there are registers for, for example, sexual offences or anything that might put your other employees at risk. I mean, what kind of crime are we talking about where an employer would need to know? Well, um, maybe stealing from your employer. I mean, that, that could easily get you four years, I'd have thought. But if your circumstances change, then you won't do it again. You'd like to think so, but that's a pretty idealistic view of the world, isn't it? Well, I am quite idealistic. I know, and I don't criticise you for that. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather someone was oh, idealistic than not at all idealistic. But <laughs> yeah. in practical terms, I think you do have to look at it sometimes from the employer's point of view and think, well, is this actually going to make any material difference, Mary? <laughs> I had my safeguarding training because I'm a trustee of the London Transport Museum and we have... You're all glamour jobs, don't you? But it was interesting. It was literally, (laughs) how do you spot predators in a museum context? And I can tell you, um, I would want to be... um, So we learnt about the disclosure and barring service and one of the good innovations on that is that... Because often people do... Commit, commit crimes, but then they don't go to court. So only a, about 3% of rape rape cases go to court and only about 1% end in a conviction. So in a way, you know, rape is a, is a, is a kind of penalty-free crime in this country. It's absolutely extraordinary. But if you... The, the form has now changed so that the chief constable can now write his or her remarks. So they can say... John, Bill, whoever, um, has been arrested and questioned for these crimes, these allegations, but no no criminal charges were brought. And I find that that is actually a good way to be. So I, I wonder about this offences against the person, the ability to commit fraud, because people are very good at sort of white-collar fraud and financial crime. They're really good at hiding their tracks. But I think in the main... Um, 
Williams mentioned Timpson. I would also mention British Gas in this regard. Having um, opportunities and routes for people to, to go straight and to, um, you know, make a life for themselves and make a living for themselves and their families if they have one after prison is in general a good thing. With the safe. But if I'm a British Gas customer, do I want somebody who's committed aggravated burglary or something coming into my house? I, no, I don't. The question is have British Gas through their processes and through their, you know, are, are they putting these people in front of vulnerable customers? So you can be employed in a call centre, you can be employed sure. as a driver, you do not necessarily have to be going. And I think that is for the employer then to decide where it is appropriate to employ people, uh, you know, in chefs in restaurants, those types of things. Um, I would not feel comfortable with, with a, a gas engineer going to, to my elderly mother's house. Tim? Well, I mean, this is part of the um, Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act which went through last last year. And I'm not sure from, from memory whether the sort of four-year thresholds and the details were laid out on the, the bill or whether these regulations are coming later. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that it does not apply to people with uh, sexual and violent uh, offences. So this isn't can't blanch everywhere. And, and clearly people with sexual offences, you've got to be really sensitive around that. But I rather agree with, uh, with William. I mean, the point of prison is to punish and rehabilitate. It's not doing either of those very well at the moment. And actually, the biggest impact um, that uh, the justice system has, has had and the recidivism rate has actually gone down quite considerably because more prisoners have been better dealt with after they've left jail in terms of trying to give them some stability of, of, of housing and potentially a, a job. And if you get a job and stick with a job, your chances of reoffending come down drastically. So I'm sure we all want to see fewer people going to a prison because they're not committing those sorts of offences, smarter punishments for those who do commit a, a offences that might actually deter them better and to make sure that they don't uh, reoffend when they uh, when they come out. So th this is controversial, but ultimately it was also um, aimed for those people who in their youth had committed some less serious uh, offences, which kept on their record and came up every time. And so they just didn't get over the threshold uh, to first base when they wanted to apply for a job and they wanted to go uh, back on the, on the straight and um, narrow. There will be some people who will abuse this, um, uh, I'm sure. But I think the principle and the thrust is right if it's properly monitored, properly um, resourced. And in a few years' time, we'll have fewer people, hopefully, in jail. And we'll have a lot fewer people who've been in jail going back to jail because they've actually are gainfully employed. And, and yet the prison service is planning for a prison population in excess of 100,000 well, within the next few years. Yeah, but that is... Um, the, the, we've got a record prison population at the uh, at the moment and too many people, as I say, are going through the revolving uh, door and going, uh, going back in. There's also the whole question about where we're going to put um, illegal migrants as well under the new um, laws to who will be committing an offence if they uh, come in boats across the channel, for um, example. We need to plan better in our prisons. Prisons uh, we've not invested properly in over many uh, decades, uh, uh, frankly, and we're really lousy, particularly for those people who are there for a number of years. You've got literally a captive audience where you should be able to uh, rehabilitate, to educate, to point them in the direction of a, a job, give them some stability uh, back in their lives that many of them won't have we've had. That doesn't work with shorter sentences, which is why I welcome yeah. the recent announcement about it's a complete waste of time, resources and effort, frankly, on the really short sentences. There are better ways of doing it. Right, more questions still to come. We have 15 more minutes and then we're going to talk about NHS dentistry. Apparently complaints about dentistry have risen by two thirds over the last five years. What your experiences? It's quarter to nine. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Israel troops clash with Hamas in the latest advance of the ground offensive. Fleur Hassan Nahum is Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. What does success in this operation look like to you? Success would mean two things. One is bring back our 230 hostages home alive in one piece. And the second thing would be dismantle the infrastructure of terrorism that has allowed this to happen, that the whole world has been funding. Why isn't Israel allowing in more humanitarian aid? We're allowing humanitarian aid as with that. Who's giving us any humanitarian aid or medical assistance for our 230 hostages? Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.48. Let's go to a call from Martin in Doncaster. Hello, Martin. Hi, Ian and panel. Is it right for a government minister to be canvassing alongside suspended MP Peter Bowen? Now, Rishi Sunak says he still has confidence in Work and Pensions Minister Tom Purslove after the Sunday Mirror showed photos of him canvassing with Peter Bone days after the vote to suspend him from the Commons. They represent neighbouring constituencies in Northamptonshire, Wellingborough for Peter Bone and Corby for Tom Purslove. Um, Tim. Uh, I was a bit surprised to see the tweeted pictures of Tom out with Peter Bone within days of that report um, coming out. They're neighbouring MPs, they're close friends. Tom actually used to work for Peter, I think he was a researcher before Tom then came into uh, uh, into Parliament. Didn't decently expose himself to him. Um, and, uh, I mean, no way defending um, Peter Bone and just reading the um, report and uh, quite a few raised um, raised eyebrows, although he's, he's denying it um, uh, vigorously, but is going to be subject to a recall um, petition. That could be the end of his parliamentary um career. I'm not aware that there are any police investigations uh, ongoing. But I think probably given the proximity of the announcement or the publicity around Peter Bone, who has no longer got the Conservative uh, whip, um, then it might have been slightly more sensible to distance yourself. Um, certainly I wouldn't have done that, but that's for I mean, if they are close friends, um, I mean, I've, I've got a number of friends who've been involved in quite high-profile political scandals, and I'm always tempted to show my support for them because I, I genuinely sort of feel sorry for the position that e even if I know that they're guilty, sure. just as a human being, what kind of friend are you if you don't show support at a, at a time of crisis? The, the, uh, and I entirely appreciate that, and I've probably done the same in the uh, in the past. The problem is, just a few days before, a fairly damning report had yeah. been published, which resulted in the House of Commons unanimously voting for quite a stiff penalty uh, against um, Peter Bone. And however supportive you want to be towards Peter, so soon being seen, seen out shoulder to shoulder with him, for a government minister as well, is slightly unwise, mm. put it, put it uh, okay. that way. Mary, have you ever been in that position where somebody you've known has been involved in something that, I mean, some kind of scandal and you've had to maybe distance yourself or not? Yes, and um, and I think you're, to your point about offering support, I think there are ways of doing that. Um, but I think this speaks to Tom Bur Persglove's judgment. Um, anyone reading the... Um, Tim said he, he used to work for Peter Bone... Um, the report described how Peter Bone indecently exposed himself to one of his staff and, you know, was was very... It just sounds like utterly horrible bullying behaviour. And I think it, it really calls his judgement of this government minister into question that he is seen out and about. I don't know whether they were canvassing. I don't know if they were going for a beer. I'm not sure canvassing. what... They were well, again, I mean, why do you think that's a good idea? Uh, do you think that sort of Peter Bone's Brexit record is going to, you know, mean that people won't remember what they read in the papers or saw on the televisions that week. It seems bizarre, frankly, and I think he, he's not said anything about it. The Prime Minister says he has full confidence in him. I, I, it just seems weird. Okay. Natasha? I think you have to look at the nature of the accusations against Peter Bone and the <clears> optics <throat> of this because we know there is an issue with people who are victims of this type of predatory behaviour not speaking out because in these situations powerful men are automatically believed. Now I'm not saying that Peter Bone is guilty or not because we have yet to find out there's an ongoing investigation but the optics of this are that Peter Bone is going to be automatically believed. And I think we have to to ask ourselves what signal that sends in terms of the culture around these types of offences generally. William. Um, yeah, I think this is, as, as Mary suggested, a sort of an example of somebody's sort of friendship running up against um, their... Um, their sort of political, sort of the political opposites, or their sort of political role, basically. I mean, if if Pers Love is weird enough to want to spend um, his weekend going out canvassing with um, Peter Bain, that's perhaps his his own matter. Um, and whether or not he gets snapped by the Sunday Mirror is again, you know, I think part of the course and the life of a politician. And I think he has to expect that 
to go out with somebody who's just been <laughs> to go out canvassing, I should say, with somebody who's just been involved in such a sort of prominent scandal and might be forced to uh, resign as an MP in the near future is probably a very silly thing to do. Whether it's something that Rishi Sunak should sack him over, I wouldn't necessarily think so, um, because I don't think it, it, it has anything to do with his um, a political judgment, be sort of ministerial judgment, um, but I think it just makes Bez Glover look like a bit of a wally brain, really. Yeah, political judgment. Wally brain. A wally brain. Excellent use. Like no, no, no. Term wally is. brain. <laughs> That's the sort of phrase they use in Tatler. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's take a text question from Ellie in Stockport. Uh, Rishi Sunak will do a live in conversation about AI with Elon Musk later this week as part of a big summit. Should we be alarmed or pleased to see our Prime Minister working with someone like him? Now, Elon Musk is attending the two-day AI summit at Bletchley Park on Wednesday and Thursday and will take part in a live broadcast on Twitter Twitter, I'm still going to call it Twitter, you can do one with your exes, on (laughs) Thursday night. However, world leaders, including Joe Biden, Emmanuel Macron, Justin Trudeau and Olaf Scholz, are all not expected to turn up to the summit. That's that's interesting because I'm sure I read yesterday that Macron was turning up, but uh, anyway. Um, Who should we go to first on this? Natasha. You have to look at what Elon Musk has done to Twitter. And I'm like you, I refuse to call it X, will always be Twitter to me. It used to be a place where you could know who people were because there was a blue tick system for verification. So know you were getting your information from a reliable source where you could get to breaking news and opinion first and where you could genuinely share ideas. Now, it didn't used to be perfect, but Elon Musk has, in the short time he has been at the helm, completely destroyed everything that that platform stood for. So when you're talking about something as serious as AI and the potential threat it poses to our entire society and the way that we live, yes, I'm incredibly concerned that Rishi Sunak thinks that Elon Musk is the person to be consulting with on this. And I can assure you we will not be taking it live on my programme on Thursday (laughs) night. Uh, LBC News might do, but we won't. Uh, William? Um, I have to disagree with um, Natasha on this one. I think if you're going to be discussing um, the future of um, AI, indeed, um, the future of the planet, since um, Elon Musk has got this plan to try and move us all to Mars, um, I think he's probably a much more interesting and useful person to be talking to than, say, Kamala Harris, <coughs> um, or whoever China sends to ascend, and certainly um, also Ursula von der Leyen. Um, I think, you know, AI will future historians sort of look back in 20, 30 years' time and actually think that this week's summit on AI was more important than what's going on in the Middle East? Probably not. Nevertheless, you know, uh, lots of different organisations are now saying we may reach the point of a superintelligence within the next decade, which sort of raises Skynet-style probabilities of the entire human race being sort of wiped out. I'd say that Elon Musk probably knows more about technology um, than uh, an awful lot of the sort of politicians involved. And so, yes, I think it's probably worthwhile for Rishi Sunak to sit down and talk to him about it. Tim? Uh, I I agree. With who? If you... I agree agree with William, but I don't necessarily agree with Elon Musk. But just because you invite somebody to a really important summit doesn't mean you agree or have to agree with them. Like it or not, Elon Musk owns one of the largest social media platforms in the world, which wields huge influence. Now, I've been tackled quite a lot recently about should China be invited to this AI summit, because I've been sanctioned by uh, China. I'm very critical of China. Some of my colleagues have said, no, China shouldn't be part of it. Alas, China needs to be part of it, because if you keep them out of the tent, then there's very little prospect of trying to rein them in when they go beyond the rules which they weren't party to um, formulating and accepting. AI is one of the huge great challenges that the whole of uh, the, the, this planet faces. We have got to make sure we regulate it properly, effectively, with as many people signed up to those regulations as early as possible. And Elon Musk needs to be there to be disagreed with or agreed with or to have his input in it, just as the Chinese and many okay. others do. Otherwise, it's never going to work. Very quickly, Mary. Joke about, um, you know, it's a huge risk to do such a high-profile event with such an unpopular leader who's prone to making catastrophic decisions, but I guess Elon (coughs) Musk knows what he's doing. Um, Look, he bought the the site... He bought the site for $44 billion a year ago. It's now worth $19 billion. The guy is by no means a tech genius. He's done great stuff on the Tesla. He's done great stuff on Spacelink. The question about who owns space is is a deeper and more profound one. 
But I think, you know, it's nice that he's coming along. I'm sure Rishi is all very excited uh, to be in the room with him. But I think actually William's wrong. I think Kamala Harris and, and the EU's regulation of AI um, will be more important in the future than what uh, Elon Musk says on Thursday. Right, our fun question for the end of the programme. Charlie in Rochester wants to know this. Following the very sad news that Matthew Perry, a.k.a. Chandler from Friends, has died, which TV character did you feel represented you as a young person? Well, you are... Uh, how old are you, William? Uh, 23 years young. You still qualify as a young person, but who represents you? Um, I'd have to say... Uh, Good old John Thor as Inspector Morse. Oh. Uh, the reason why I went to Oxford and um, the reason why I like real really? and the reason why I've got such a naff dress sense. Um, <laughs> yes, no, you are. Cynical, <laughs> grumpy. And he only yeah, watches ITV3. Grumpy and, like, <laughs> detective stories. That was, uh, that was basically me as a oh, teenager, wasn't unfortunately. wasn't the answer I was expecting. Go on, surprise us, Natasha. Well, you know, growing up in a tiny Essex village as part of a mixed, mixed race family um, and uh, being toweringly tall and bisexual and <laughs> lots of other things. I didn't have many role models, but I would say the closest would probably be Ashley in The Fresh, Print, in the Fresh Prince. Never, I've never heard no. of it. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I have That's heard right. of it, but I've never seen it. Oh, you've got homework tonight. <laughs> oh, have I? <laughs> Mary. Well, I was going to say Bridget J Jones because when I I, I, was I can sort of, see that. Yeah, I had a great twenties. <laughs> None of it was on social media, <laughs> thank God. And um, you know, cigarettes. Who was your Colin Firth then? Uh, that would be telling. It a, would. a lady That's never tells. Asking. I'm no lady, Ian, but I'm still <laughs> so not telling. Tell. <laughs> Tim, I hate these sorts. Of <laughs> OK, so in my generation, I grew up with um, Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds. So Joe Ninety. And Joe, Joe Ninety, but he was a bit of a lightweight compared to Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, who fought for the future of planet Earth. You know, I was really motivated by him to go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> what, a <laughs> rubbish, eh? what a really good question, but crikey. I think I'll, <laughs> I'll just say David Cassidy. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that was As nice. opposed to Donny yeah. Osmond. Oh, right, thank you very much indeed to all of you for coming on the show tonight. Tomorrow's panel includes Sir John Redwood, the Liberal Democrats education spokesperson, Manira Wilson, the Daily Mail and Mail on Sunday columnist, Sarah Vine, and the New Statesman's political journalist, Zoe Grunewald. So join us for that from 8 o'clock tomorrow. Coming up in the next hour, record numbers of patients are complaining to the NHS Ombudsman about poor care, exorbitant fees, and difficulty getting treatment from NHS dental services in England. Um, I don't know if it's any different in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. I, I somehow suspect not. So I want to know your experience of using NHS dental services. Um, the complaints have gone up by two thirds over five years. That is an appalling statistic. Why is this happening and what can be done to improve NHS dental services? 0345 6060 973. It's the number to call. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC.